Welcome to everyone. I'm Pedro Barri. I'm the head of the OBGYN department at the Deseus University Hospital in, in Barcelona. Uh, dear colleagues, this is an IPSA educational activity entitled uh, Choosing the Ovarian Stimulation Protocol. ACG helps modeling nature. Today we have the privilege of uh, having uh, Dominique Desigler to cover this topic. And uh, Dominique, as you know, is one of the best speakers to deliver uh, his talk. Mm -hmm. Although I'm sure most of you know him very well, I would like just to remind a few uh, aspects of uh, his CV. Uh, Dominique uh, was trained in the USA. Uh, he did his fellowship and and residency at the University of California, Los Angeles. Then he came back to Europe and he worked for a long time at the Koshen Hospital as uh, the head of the Division of uh, Endocrinology and Reproductive Medicine. And uh, he has uh, authored more than 250 PubMed uh, publications and uh, he is, as you know, an associate editor of uh, Fertility and Sterility. And uh, his uh, current position is uh, Dominique right now is a consultant and emeritus professor at the Foch Hospital in uh, Paris West University. So, Dom, it's uh, my pleasure to invite you and uh, the beautiful floor is yours. Thank you. Bob. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pedro. This is a kind introduction and it is a privilege for me to really talk to you about uh, OS uh, ovarian stimulation protocols and how LHFX in the form of ACG is going to actually uh, help uh, modeling nature. This is the objective of the talk and I'll try to convince you that this is the fact uh, and I hope I'll succeed to that. Uh, the topic we're going to address are LH in the menstrual cycle and ovarian stimulation cycles, uh, LH effects, LH or ACG, uh, what are the differences? And then we're going to talk about HMG, ovarian uh, menopausal gonadotrophin versus recombinant FSH. Uh, pregnancy, live birth, and cumulative live birth rates. Number of oocytes are the topic we're going to talk about. Placental ACG and pituitary ACG. ACG is produced by the placenta, also produced by the pituitary, but not exactly the same as we will see. And then we will talk in the end at the patient profiles that is suitable for treatment with uh, Merioford, which is a new. Um, HMG preparation with ACG of uh, placental origin. Uh, LH in the natural cycle, this is essentially what we have. Uh, you have to the left the small follicles uh, and uh, FSH receptor, plenty of FSH receptor. And then in the end, as the follicle grows, it loses the FSH receptors and acquires uh, LH receptors. Uh, this is what's happening in a natural cycle. And this is the model that we're going to try to follow in the ovarian stimulation cycle. Uh, this is what we have, uh, FSH on the granulosa cell, LH on the theca cells. LH actually transforms uh, androgens, which is then uh, diffusing to the, to the granulosa cell where it is aromatized. And later in the follicular phase, FSH starts to decline while LH increases. As we know, as we just said, the LH receptors increase. Uh, LH receptors are acquired on the, uh, on the uh, granulosa cells. And uh, LH actually still plays a role for producing uh, androgens. And as we will see, but just a preview of that, 
if LH is lacking, if LH effect is insufficient, then the uh, androgens is not produced. And there's the backflow with increase in progesterone, which is something we're going to talk about. This is more precisely what's going on. You have here the granulosa cells and the teca cells. Granulosa cells aromatizes androgens that come from the teca cells. And LH is actually helping the production of androgens. As I said before, if LH is missing, as in ovarian stimulation with pure FSH, then you have a backflow of that because this is not occurring in sufficient amount. And you have a backflow with an increase in progesterone in the peripheral blood. Uh, GnRH analogs, antagonist and agonist. If you look at agonists, agonists do actually decrease serum LH profoundly. And it doesn't matter which agonist you use and you see what you have. But the antagonist, this is the uh, diagram of a single injection of antagonist with different doses. It doesn't really matter. This is cetratide, 025 and higher doses. And you see that there's a profound decrease in LH in the antagonist uh, protocol as well. This is again a single injection data. Uh, LH effects, LH versus ACG. Uh, this is LH to the left, and this is ACG with its uh, C terminal carboxyl group, which actually uh, changes not the affinity for the LH receptor, but changes the half life of the product making it long lasting. Uh, this is in uh, a mouse model. And you have, I want you to concentrate on this curve and this one here, the black curves. This is wild LH uh, levels uh, adjusted, administered in the rat. And you see how the level decrease over time uh, uh, after the injection of 75 units. And this is ACG, and you see that ACG lasts much longer because of this carboxyl terminal. Now, uh, because of that too, in terms of CMP production in the granulosa cell, you see that there is uh, a marked increase in the ACG versus LH in terms of amount produced uh, by an order of magnitude. Now, this is a seminal work of Marco Filicori, uh, which he did uh, in Bologna, Italy, in which actually he stimulated ovarian function with FSH. And on the eighth day of the stimulation, he either kept FSH or increases uh, or gave increasing amount of ACG. And in the last group, D group, only ACG stop the FSH altogether. And this is what you have in terms of three type of follicles, more than 14. There's essentially no difference. Actually, if you give ACG, the stimulation is the same. Uh, no difference either in the 10 to 14 milli, uh, millimeter follicles, uh, but there is a marked difference in the number of small follicles. This is FSH. And when you substitute FSH for ACG, then there are lower amount of the small follicles, which is the follicle you don't want, because those are the follicles that give you the hyperstimulation. Now, as a preview of what we're going to talk about in a few seconds, let me tell you that a similar study has been conducted with recombinant LH, and you could actually duplicate the work of Marco Filicori with recombinant LH, but, but, yeah. And you have to give it twice a day for it to work because of the half-life of LH versus ACG. Uh, this is again the work for Pilicori. And then you have here the ratio of inhibin B over inhibin A. And you see that this is high in the early stages of the ovarian stimulation as compared in HMG as compared to FSH. And it inverses itself uh, when you have the larger follicle. And you have here 
lower inhibin B, which gives you uh, larger, an increase in larger follicles with HMG, uh, as shown by Marco. Now, HMG increases uh, mitochondrial gene expression in the granulosa cells, and this is the difference between HMG and the REC FSH, and that probably is an important factor on the follicle. Now, ACG contained in human reproductive uh, menopausal gonadotropins actually increases uh, androgens in the uh, circulation, and this is uh, understood Dion. And you see here uh, an ovarian stimulation with FSH to which 150 units of FSH to which were added either zero unit of ACG or increasing amount of ACG up and above uh, the FSH from the beginning of the stimulation. And this is the work that shows that if you just give FSH, this is what you have in terms of endocene dione, and you have higher levels when you increase uh, with um, uh, increasing amount of ACG. Now, uh, this is the uh, FSH receptors, and you see that the FSH receptors increase with uh, the mRNA expression of the androgen receptor in the granulosa cells. And so therefore, the androgen story is important because it increases the FSH receptors, and that's particularly important in the older patients because as we will see, there is a decrease in androgens in older women. And you see FSH receptor increases with uh, higher doses. This is again the same study, higher doses of uh, uh, androgens receptors. And there again, uh, when you add uh, ACG to FSH, either zero unit or increasing amount up to 150 units up and above FSH, you have an increase in the number of top quality embryos, which becomes significant for 100 and 150 units of ACG. Uh, top quality embryos for patients, this is again the same study, doses of zero, 50, 100, 150, given up and above the FSH stimulation. And you see that you have an increased amount of top quality embryos uh, in the uh, higher doses of ACG added to FSH. Now, uh, in terms of euploidy rate, this is a, in a uh, multivariate uh, uh, study of the previous study. You have uh, HMG actually has an impact on euploidy rate, uh, which reaches statistical significance. HMG versus FSH. This is what we're going to look at. And this is uh, the study by Smith, which shows that comparing FSH versus HMG uh, highly purified, there is a decrease in serum progesterone toward the la later days of the stimulation uh, in the um, people receiving HMG as compared to uh, the FSH group. And you have actually uh, the opposite for understanding the young. Now, uh, in terms of uh, a diagram uh, of what is going on, you see that with FSH, you have higher levels of estradiol early on in the stimulation. Uh, this is due to uh, the higher inhibin uh, B in the HMG group. And this is how it is reverted at the time when you want the follicles to be, pr to be present uh, with HMG, uh, having higher uh, levels of estradiol per follicle. This is a work by late uh, Dr. Kilani. Uh, who left us uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, and this is uh, the impact comparing HMG versus FSH uh, in 50 patients in each group. 
and you see that the duration of ovarian stimulation uh, is longer with FSH as compared to HMG. And the doses used is also higher uh, with FSH as compared to HMG. Uh, but the peak ovulatory estradiol uh, is higher uh, within the HMG group. Now, uh, HMG results in slightly but significantly higher uh, live birth rates as compared to FSH. And this is a Cochrane data analysis review. And you see that uh, the mean value of the HMG side. This is again another uh, more recent meta-analysis indicating that HMG gives better results than FSH. Slight, but significantly so, in terms of clinical pregnancy rates, in terms of live birth rates, and in terms of cumulative live birth. Uh, and that actually works in the antagonist and in the agonist cycle. This is work by Paul DeVroy for the antagonist. And you see that live birth rate in the HMG group is higher as compared to REC FSH. And the same is found by uh, uh, Dr. Anderson in the GenRH agonist, where you have live birth rate, which is higher in the HMG group as compared to FSH. Now, the number of oocytes, this is slightly different. But what we count really, what we care really for are the embryos. But in terms of oocytes, we have a uh, slightly larger number of oocytes with FSH uh, in the three uh, studies that are here comparing FSH versus HMG, in spite of the fact that in the end you have higher pregnancy rate and live birth rate in the HMG group. Now, a very important study by Nikos Polizos actually looks at the impact of the number of oocytes you get. Because again, things have changed. We now understand with the uh, antagonist protocol that we can prevent hyperstimulation. And therefore, what really counts is what is optimal for the patient. And you see that uh, with the fresh and cumulative light birth rate, with the fresh, you have a plateau at about 15 number of uh, oocytes retrieved. Uh, but this increases uh, when you look at the cumulative live birth rate. And this curve here, uh, I hope that you can actually see this, is the free zone uh, approach, which is now followed by lots of groups. Uh, in our case, we do actually 65 to 70% free zone. Now, in women over 38 years of age, uh, you have uh, here the results with the number of uh, oocytes retrieved and the cumulative life birth rate. So what you see is that in uh, the 44, nothing really works anymore. But in the women who are 42 to 43, 40 to 41, and 38 to 39, you have uh, better uh, cumulative life birth rate with a larger number of uh, follicles. So therefore, uh, uh, it, it's interesting to have to have more. Uh, Antonio Lamarca in Modena, Italy, actually showed that with a uh, larger number of oocytes you in the end have a larger number of euploid embryo. And uh, Nikos Polizos also showed that uh, with the different age group, that if in the end you have a larger number of oocytes retrieved, ultimately you have more euploid embryos. Now we talk about ACG, but you know what? 
there is ACG and ACG. There is ACG of placental origin and ACG of pituitary origin. And these are not exactly the same. Uh, there is a difference, not in the quality of oocytes, but there is a difference in the number of oocytes. Uh, this is uh, the two ACG that we're talking about. The normally glycolysidated ACG, which is produced uh, by the villus of the placenta, and it's also produced in the pituitary. And the hyperglycosylated ACG, which is produced by the invasive extra villus uh, cytotrophoblast, represented here in red, uh, which is actually represents 87% uh, of ACG produced by a woman in her third week of pregnancy and 51% in the fourth week. And these two ACG, the hyperglycosylated and the regular one, are different. And this is actually going to show a difference between two types of HMG using either pituitary, which is not and uh, placental ACG, including hyperglycosylated ACG. So this is a preview. This is a uh, preparation of uh, an other HMG preparation in which you have uh, FSH activity and LH activity. As you know, all HMG preparation need to have equal power of FSH and LH activity. But because there is less LH in the urine of menopausal women, you actually have to uh, add ACG to compensate for this LH activity, which is tested in the, in the rat. In this other preparation, uh, the LH activity comes from pituitary ACG, normally glycosylated ACG. And in the product that we are talking about now, produced by IPSA, and which is actually uh, interesting and revolutionizing a little bit of iron stimulation, is Merioferd, in which you have FSH from the pituitary uh, originating, and you have placental ACG, and for a large part, hyperplacosylated ACG, a little bit of pituitary uh, ACG, and a little bit of LH just like in the other product. Now, this is how the products are being prepared. Uh, the other uh, uh, HMG preparation, you have menopausal urine, which contains FSH, a little bit of LH, and pituitary ACG. And so this urine is being purified in order to get FSH and ACG. Uh, whereas, in the case of your fur, you have menopausal urine uh, for the FSH and a little bit of LH and pituitary ACG, just a little bit, which is purified. And then you add on to that placental, uh, sorry, pregnant urine containing placental ACG, which is then purified. And the two are mixed together uh, for the preparation. And actually, uh, this is the actual purity. This is the other uh, HMG preparation with FSH and ACG and all kinds of impurity that are found on this uh, gel column. Whereas in the case of Merioferd, you have FSH uh, and ACG and no, none of these contaminants. So therefore the product is of a higher purity. Mayofert is a uh, highly purified HMG uh, using uh, FSH from the pituitary and 75 units of LH activity, but as we said, from ACG uh, originating from uh, urine of pregnant women. And this is going to make the difference as we will see. And now I'm gonna share with you also, the issue of FSH uh, contained in this uh, preparation. The Merioferd has a uh, FSH that contains all variety of isoforms, whereas the uh, other HMG uh, is not as rich 
in the uh, uh, acylated uh, FSH preparation and not as broad, I would say, as the one of Mario Ferg. Now, there are two studies that looked at the effect of Mario Ferg. These are randomized controlled trials. And the first one is the Italian study, uh, which actually was conducted in Italy, three sites in Italy. And there is a second study that was conducted in Europe uh, and six different sites. One of the sites was uh, my uh, group uh, when I was at Cochin and uh, 270 patients. And we combined the results of the Italian and European study. Those are prospective randomized uh, trials comparing the new uh, HMG preparation, Merioford, versus the classical reference, the other HMG preparation. Uh, and this is the uh, Italian study, 225 initial dose units were uh, in the European studies of the uh, Merioford published by uh, Lockwood. Uh, there was 150 until the age of 35 and 225 units for women who were above 35. The doses were adjusted on day four or five or five. Uh, triggering of our, this is an agonist long protocol, uh, standard long protocol. The uh, ovulation was triggered with ACG and then IVF was conducted and embryo transfer took place either on day two or three or in the European study on day three or, uh, or on um, blastocyst stage. Uh, the uh, luteal phase support was IM progesterone for the Italian study and vaginal progesterone for the European study. And these are the results. Now, combine the two studies, the Italian one and the uh, European one. And you see that the number of all sites retrieved, again, this is HMG versus HMG, but different sources of ACG. This is the one that has a referred ACG of placental origin. And you have 10.3 all sites retrieved versus nine in the other HMG preparation. So this is a statistically significant difference in number of all sites. If you look at mature all sites, the difference is even bigger because the uh, rate of retrieved oocytes over mature is higher uh, for the uh, Merioford. So you have 9.1 mature oocytes, M2s, versus 7.4. The amount, even though the original dose at the beginning was set, nonetheless, nonetheless, the amount of HMG used was less in the Merioford group as compared to the HMG because mainly because it lasted less. The duration of the stimulation was 10.6 days versus 11, and that is statistically significant. Now, the results. Again, combine uh, Italian and European study for Merioford and the other HMG. Number of oocytes retrieved, this is a difference. Number of mature oocytes, as I said, markedly different. Uh, so again, now we're talking HMG versus HMG, and the difference is not in the quality of the uh, embryos, but a difference in the number of oocytes and ultimately the number of embryos to uh, play with. The amount used uh, for the major fruit was less uh, as compared to the other HMG, in spite of the fact that the original dose was set by the protocol. So the difference is mainly the result of the difference in the duration in terms of uh, duration of stimulation. The major effort lasted on average one day less. And these are the ultimate results. And you see that there's no statistical significance between major effort and the other HMG. But in the end, when you look at the cumulative pregnancy rate, uh, because uh, you have more uh, embryos uh, in the uh, Merioford group, you have a trend toward a higher uh, cumulative pregnancy rate because you have more frozen embryos to transfer. 
The last point I want to talk to you about is who is suitable for treatment with Mario Fur. Well, there are women with low LH levels, and we have sometimes to measure LH, and you have to be careful about that. Then we're going to talk about the unselected population. We're going to talk about the advanced age. We're going to talk about the poor respondents and the high respondents. Now, the patient with low levels of, his, of, of LH, uh, less than 0.5, do not as well in FSA stimulation cycle uh, than women with higher LH levels. But the addition of low dose UNAHCG can actually improve those results of women with poor, uh, with low LH levels. This is the low LH, less than 0.5 MIUs per ml. And you see that the implantation rate is lower than in the group that has an LH level larger than 0.5 per ml. However, if you take the uh, women with the low LH and you add ACG up and above, then not only you can, uh, you can correct the problem, but possibly there is a trend toward even better. And in terms of lipothrate is the same. This is the women with low LH versus women with high LH. And if you take the low LH women who would have this results, but you add the ACG, then uh, you uh, actually correct the problem. This is very important. This means that providing a ovarian stimulation that contains ACG is going to fix that problem of patient with low LH. Now, women of advanced age. I wish we didn't have women of advanced age, but I know that Pedro and I have a lot of women of advanced age because this is the way it is. As women have advanced, advanced in age, their testosterone level decreases, DHEA level decreases, free testosterone, and androstenedione. dione. Uh, this decreases with age. And as we said before, the, the LH effect from the ACG contained in HMG actually corrects that. Now, if you look at testosterone levels, this is a meta-analysis. Uh, the testosterone level in women uh, of advanced age and poor responders, you see that it is markedly lower uh, than uh, normal. And the same for understanding Dion as compared to control. Now, as we already said that you've seen this study uh, before, uh, this is a study comparing uh, uh, high, highly purified HMG versus uh, REC FSH. And you see that there is an increase uh, in uh, uh, the androcine dione and testosterone in the group receiving uh, HMG. So therefore, you correct the problem in some ways that is encountered in women uh, of higher age. And this is the androcine dione and testosterone uh, comparing H HP, uh, high, highly purified HMG versus FSH. And you see that androcine dione is higher and it is statistically significant as compared to stimulation with FSH and the same for testosterone. Now, not only it works with the poor responders, but it also works in the high responders. These are women who all have uh, an AMH level uh, more than five nanogram per ml. This is uh, a work that we had seen at ASRM, but is now just came out a couple of weeks ago uh, in the press in fertility and sterility. And you have here a women high responders all have an uh, AMH larger than five. And you see uh, this is the ongoing pregnancy rate. Uh, black is uh, HMG versus FSH. Uh, this is the live birth rate and uh, fresh and the live birth rate when you include on top of that 
the frozen embryos and you see the difference uh, is now rich in statistical significance. Uh, the cumulative uh, live birth rate uh, and the uh, number of embryos transferred, uh, less were transferred in the HMG group uh, and blastocysts transferred, therefore uh, it should have been uh, hampering the HMG, but it did not actually. When you look at pregnancy losses uh, for fresh and FET, uh, this is the fresh and you have a lower pregnancy loss rate in the HMG as compared to the uh, FSH. So, so this is an issue of quality. There are two issues there, quality of embryos and quantity. With HMG, you have a uh, higher quality of embryos. This is cumulative with frozen embryo transfer. Uh, and you see that again, you have a lower risk of miscarriage. Uh, HMG gives you better quality embryos. Times to conclude, and I want to again emphasize this issue of quality and quantity because uh, HMG gives you higher quality embryos, but then there is one point that this new HMG preparation may refer that has uh, its LH activity from ACG of placental origin also has a higher quantity, same quality, but higher quantity. The suppression of LH levels in the generic analog agonists and antagonists may have a clinical uh, importance. And therefore you want probably correct that uh, in order to mimic nature as much as possible. ACG driven LH activity modulates follicular genesis and storage genesis towards a more homogeneous follicular cohort and more androgenic follicular milieu, which is, as we said, mostly important in women uh, of advancing age. ACG-driven LH activity appears to have beneficial effect on embryo quality. HMG having its LH effect from ACG as compared to FSH gives you better quality embryos. Uh, but the ACG, uh, the effect of ACG-driven activity is interpreted into a significant effect on clinical outcome with higher life birth rate as compared with, with FSH, better life birth rate as FSH. Uh, however, studies using ACG driven, uh, driven LH activity for menopausal women, predatory uh, ACG, result in significantly lower retrieved number of oocytes as compared to FSH. Now, we talked about the quality, higher quality of embryos with HMG, but the use of placental ACG as in the Mayofield preparation instead of pituitary ACG appears to be substantially different in terms of, uh, in terms of number of all size due to the isoform acidity of the ACG. Uh, the difference is interpreted in clinical outcome with comparable benefit on oocyte site and real quality with purity of menopausal ACG, but higher efficacy in terms of number of oocytes retrieved and cumulative life birth rate. Placental ACG allows to deliver the effect of ACG driven LH, LH activity without compromising the number of oocytes retrieved. So therefore, HMG better embryo quality. But HMG with uh, ACG of placental origin not only give you the same improvement on quality, but also increases the quantity. The number of all sites retrieved is strictly associated with cumulative life birth rate and may refer to benefit women with low LH levels, unselected population, advanced age, poor responders, and high responses. And with this, I think I've, and I hope at least, I've convinced you that uh, providing an ovarian stimulation that includes LH effect of ACG origin 
mimics nature. And then I also try to convince you of the fact that there are two types of ACG uh, that you can use to uh, provide this LH effect. You have the pituitary ACG, which is provided in the other HMG preparation, and you have the ACG of uh, originating from uh, placental origin, which actually has the same impact on quality, but also increases the number of uh, oocytes and in the end, embryos available. With this, I would like to thank you very much for listening to this. Thank you. Well done, Dominique. It has been a very, very interesting overview on this topic. And we would like to take advantage of having you with us today to ask a few questions that uh, I'm sure will interest the audience. I fear the worst. Uh, but I'm no. ready for all questions. Okay. Uh, the first question, <clears throat> Dominique, you have shown that uh, in both uh, cases, uh, generates agonist and generates antagonist, um, LH was suppressed and there was a benefit of adding LH to the standard stimulation protocol. Uh, do you think that uh, using one or another analog uh, will change the indication or uh, for LH uh, co-treatment, or should we change the dose of LH according to the agonist use? Okay, Pedro, this is a very interesting question, and actually uh, both uh, analogs, agonists and antagonists, decrease LH. Uh, the effect is even stronger. Uh, I showed you only one injection, the effect of one injection, but with repeated uh, antagonist injections, the effect is even stronger. And so uh, I would say that uh, providing uh, LH effects in the stimulation is necessary in both, particularly the antagonist. What is really interesting is that for those who go back several years, and that's the case of you and I, uh, we remember when we thought that LH was bad. Yeah. But this is not the case. This is not the case. Actually, in the natural cycle, you have an LH effect toward the end of the follicular phase, and it makes sense to actually provide that in the ovarian stimulation. Yeah, yeah. You are totally right. You remember then it was said that LH was a bad friend yeah. in, in the framework of ovarian stimulation. Uh, I have another question, uh, Don. Uh, what do you think uh, is the ideal schedule? for giving LH at the beginning of the stimulation, at the end, or throughout uh, the whole period of ovarian stimulation? Hmm. This is again a very interesting question. Uh, if you were to actually just look at the effect uh, comparing to the natural cycle, you might actually make a point that you only need uh, the uh, LH effect toward the second half of the stimulation. But actually, uh, the LH effect is beneficial in the early phases of the stimulation as well. And I would actually recommend using uh, HMG throughout the stimulation. Great. And th this is clinically relevant because our colleagues will uh, appreciate this indication uh, compared to the Filicori studies that he yeah and that uh, LH at the end of the stimulation. And I totally agree with you when you say that it's better of the stimulation. Hmm? An another interesting point uh, from your presentation is uh, the, difference you, the differences you have shown that there exist between pituitary and placental ACG and uh, you have shown that the, the purity and the, the, the hyperglycosylation uh, content of uh, placental, placental HG, let's say Mediofer, could uh, enhance uh, the, 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 the effect of the, this preparation. That's yeah, complex. this is very, this is very <coughs> Pedro, this is very, very puzzling because many of us thought there is a CG period. 
but in fact, there is ACG and ACG. ACG is being produced by the pituitary, which is not obvious to everybody. Uh, we have to, to go back to the fact that we add ACG in the HMG preparation because HMG is uh, actually defined not by its content, but by its bioactivity. And therefore, because the urine of menopausal women don't have enough LH, then you have to add ACG. Now, surprisingly enough, ACG of pituitary origin uh, and the ACG from the invading part of the, uh, of the trophoblast are different. And the hyperglycosylated ACG uh, of the invading trophoblast offers a uh, half-life that is longer and higher bioactivity. And so what actually what you have in the end is really interesting is that uh, ACG uh, increases the quality uh, of the embryos. But ACG of placental origin not just increases the quality, but also increases the quantity. Uh, it keeps the same effect on quality, but increases the quantity because of the half-life of the hyperglycosylated ACG. Yeah, but <clears throat> let's uh, look at the, the, the drawbacks. Uh, although nowadays we, we can almost avoid the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation, uh, is there any increased risk of ovarian hyperstimulation by using uh, Mediofer, a gonotropin preparation containing placental ACG, compared to the urinary uh, HMG? Well, interesting, because actually uh, in the studies that compared uh, the Italian studies and the European studies that compare Mayofert versus the classical HMG, uh, the Italian study showed a slight increase in hyperstimulation. But the European study was the opposite. So actually, it's an issue of, and this was in the agonist protocol, sure. which we don't use anymore. Uh, and so this is an issue of uh, adjusting the doses accordingly. Uh, but uh, today, with the antagonist protocol and the possibility of avoiding hyperstimulation with the agonist trigger, uh, I don't think this is a problem. This is an advantage. I, I totally agree, Dominique. Uh, I have another point I would like to discuss with you. Is uh, You have uh, very nicely shown the... Uh, different physiopathological mechanism eh, eh, within the ovary uh, according to the drug use. And uh, my point is, uh, it has been said, the premature progesterone rise or elevation before ovulation or the day of, at the day of, of uh, ovulation triggering could be harmful for the outcome of the cycle. Uh, do you think that there is any difference when using Mediofer compared to other preparations? This is a story that has been on for quite a while. Okay, uh, The first uh, report uh, that progesterone increased in the agonist protocol uh, was by Schoolcraft and Meldrum way, way back. And we realized that this increase in progesterone is not an escape from the agonist. It's occurring in the ovary itself. And actually, uh, it's occurring because there is a lack of LH effect on the theca cells. And therefore, there is a lack of antigen production in the theca cells and the backflow uh, of uh, progesterone. So therefore, what happens is that if you use an HMG preparation, the occurrence, the risk of an occurrence of an increased progesterone before, uh, before ovulation is markedly less. Uh, this is a problem that is essentially encountered with uh, FSH stimulation. Thank you, Dominique. And I have uh, a final question. Uh, do you know that it, we have in the market some uh, preparations containing recombinant LH? Do you think that this is uh, a clinically good alternative 
to use? Uh, it's, this is, this is, I mean, Pedro, this is very interesting because, uh, you know, the old Bertolari, the, the, the father way, way back, uh, thought that if there is LH, then there is a need to give LH, okay? And this is why uh, Serrano prepared a uh, recombinant LH. But... What happens is the uh, half-life of LH is too short. And actually, if you want to duplicate all the effects that we talked about, you could do it with LH, but you have to give it twice a day, which is really impractical. The work by Marco Filicari, when you want to replace FSH by uh, ACG, you can do that with LH, but you have to give it twice a day. So actually, unfortunately, uh, LH, recombinant LH is not really helpful. No, and, and I think that apart from uh, being uh, non-practical, it's much more expensive than I think. And, that, and uh, much more expensive. Yeah, the, the clinical uh, uh, benefit is, uh, is absolutely very, very, very low. And I think that there has no future, the use of recombinant LH. Uh, Dominic, I have no more questions, but if you want to add any uh, comment to your uh, excellent presentation, it's time to do it. Well, it really, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. And, and uh, Pedro and I have seen the involvement of uh, ovarian stimulation for years. And it's amazing how things go around and come around. Uh, and now we have uh, ways to actually stimulate the ovary that is pretty close to what you have in nature. And uh, it is for that reason that the use of this new product is really interesting. Thanks, Pedro. Thank you very much, Dominique, and I would like to conclude by thanking IPSA for its permanent commitment in uh, education and academic activities. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye.